In this second video of our uh, development of life unit, we're going to take a look actually at the evolution of humans and hominid species, meaning species that walk on two legs. And this is IB uh, topic D3. Now this is a really pretty interesting topic because the, the big question behind human evolution is really are we still evolving? And uh, to be honest, I don't have an answer for that. Uh, I don't think really many people do. Um, what's interesting about the human species and Homo sapiens is that we have this unique ability to control our environment and beyond that we can control other organisms environments um, and so it'll be really interesting to see how humans continue to change and develop their environments um, and what effect that will have on the human species uh, within the next 50, 100, 200, 300, however many years uh, in the hopes that we don't destroy our planet uh, before we get to that point. Um, but to get uh, to kind of get some background information on this, we're going to look at uh, human evolution and what we've seen in the past and very much related species. And before we get into that, we want to talk about what is a half-life and basically how we can determine the age of something. And a half-life is basically that uh, there's a radioactive um, element uh, that's, that's present and uh, it, it, once something dies it's going to, those elements are going to decay to uh, something called a daughter isotope. And that process of decay or breaking down occurs at a fixed rate. And that rate of decay, how long it actually takes for half of the sample to decay is something we call half-life. Um, and so that's what we're going to look at here to, to begin. Uh, and this, what this allows us to do is, is basically determine how old something is. So let's say we've got something, uh, a fossil here. Uh, something dies um, and during its lifetime and it accumulates uh, carbon-14. Uh, so that dies, uh, that whatever that is, it dies. And after it dies, it stops collecting carbon-14. And the carbon-14 actually begins to break down to nitrogen-14. And so somebody comes along and finds this fossil and wants to determine about how old it is. Um, and so they can take a small piece of it and, uh, in, in this process, uh, burn it to convert it to carbon dioxide gas. And the stable um, carbon actually can be compared to the unstable carbon, um, the, the change to nitrogen-14 and that can actually be measured, the amount of carbon-14 and nitrogen-14. And so by figuring out how much carbon-14 and how much nitrogen-14 is present, we can compare that to this fixed rate of, of decay for, um, for carbon-14 and nitrogen-14, and we can figure out approximately how old the sample is. And I'll give you the half-lives for carbon and for a couple of different other elements here in a few seconds. Um, and so then the question begs is, what is an isotope? Well, an isotope is an element with basically the same atomic number, but different atomic mass. And some isotopes are unstable, and they decay to another stable or another unstable isotope at a fixed rate. So this graph really does kind of a nice job of, of presenting this. Let's say we have an organism right here, and it dies, unfortunately. And it has so many different parent isotopes. Maybe that's carbon-14, maybe that's some other unstable um, isotope. Well, after one half-life, half-life right here, after one half-life, half of that parent isotope is going to be replaced or decay to daughter isotope. And so then another half-life continues and half of the remaining sample becomes now, um, decays to the, from the parent to the daughter isotope. And this process continues and continues and continues until there's a very small amount of the actual parent isotope and it's primarily the daughter isotope remaining. Um, each of these different elements uh, decay at a different rate, and so by, by figuring out how much parent isotope and daughter isotopes are present, we can get an overall, uh, basically, deduction of how, approximately how old that fossil is. For example, uh, if we were to look at an example here, um, activity, uh, organism dies, Here's our first half-life, second half-life, third half-life. If I were to say that there were um, that uh, approximately uh, 11,000 years had, had passed uh, and asked you to figure out how much um, sample was present, you could use this graph to do so. And that's basically what this, this type of graph is, is showing us. Um, when we're looking at radioisotopes, uh, here are a couple of different, different isotopes, uh, the parent isotopes, the daughter isotopes, the half-life, so the amount of time it takes for half of that sample to, uh, to change to the daughter isotopes, and then an effective dating range. And so you can see we've got kind of a wide variety here. Um, uh, the two that you will be required to know and will need to know for IB is potassium argon and carbon-14. And so potassium 
uh, the daughter isotope of that is argon-40, and then for carbon-14, it's carbon-14 and nitrogen-14. Uh, 1.3 billion years is the half-life for potassium to argon, and it has a range of 100,000 to 4.6 billion years, whereas carbon is, is a much smaller effective dating range, only 100 to 100,000 years, so, so much more recent samples. Next thing that we want to do is look at some of the major anatomical features of humans and primates now that we have an idea of how we can determine how old uh, fossils are. Um, and so there's quite a few different uh, similar features that we share between humans and primates. Uh, so this first set of images, you probably notice a couple of different things. I'll give you a chance a second to, to go ahead and look at that. And hopefully you've, you've noticed that uh, there in, in these images here there's some different uh, abilities or characteristics being shown. Uh, the grasping ability. Uh, because we have these opposable thumbs, which are pretty cool, they allow us to pick things up. Um, it allows us to, uh, well, uh, allows us to grab things. Monkeys, because of some other characteristics, are able to swing through branches. Uh, and so those are some, some of the major characteristics between humans and primates. In our second set of photos, you'll probably notice that this was focusing more on the face and the eyes. And Primates and humans have this kind of unique uh, characteristic of binocular vision. Uh, we have a reduced snout in comparison to other species, especially humans. Uh, we don't have a very long snout. Um, uh, let's see. We also, uh, so kind of going back to our first one, we've got grasping pentadactyl limbs, so we can as actually grasp things. Uh, binocular vision, reduced snout. Um, kind of have a better visual uh, because humans and primates generally are not scanning for predators uh, as much as, as some other species. Our eyes can be more straightforward, and which provides us a better overall uh, image of depth as well. Um, some other interesting characteristics, uh, twistable forelimbs. Uh, Greg Maddox, great Atlanta Braves uh, and uh, Chicago Cubs pitcher. A uh, good example of actually twisting the shoulder and the forelimbs, uh, monkeys hanging from branches and climbing from branches as well, similarities. Um, and the clavicle uh, is flexible and allows for a wide range of arm movement, which makes pitching possible. Um, some other major uh, features of humans and primates um, being the size of our skull. Uh, looking at a couple of different species here, orangutan, chimpanzee, and human, uh, the size of our skull uh, is, is rather, rather large in comparison to other species uh, in proportion to our body. Um, uh, uh, additionally, because of this, and not necessarily just because of this, but uh, because we have a larger skull, we have more room for organic matter, being the brain inside of the skull. Um, larger brain, as we'll discuss in a little bit, uh, can lead to um, increased reasoning and thought and logic. Um, and, and basically overall intelligent, intelligence. Um, some other unique features is that uh, both humans and primates are very social creatures. Um, you think about uh, chimpanzees, for example, here live in, in colonies, they're very social, um, they're touching, they're always together. Uh, humans are very much the same way, we're very much social creatures. Um, we also both have a slower reproduction period. Uh, we usually have a longer gestation, uh, the amount of time that the uh, developing offspring is in, in, within the womb. Um, and we usually only have one or, or maybe two offspring at a time, um, which allows for more increased uh, uh, basically resources to be provided to that offspring. If we look at the fossil trends in humans, um, there's some interesting trends. Uh, one of those, uh, if you look at this, you'll probably notice that um, based off of the fossil data that we've collected and fossil evidence, uh, multiple species have lived and were present uh, on the earth at the same time. And so Homo uh, sapiens are right here in this one. I realize that this image is a little bit difficult to see. Uh, this is linked on my website uh, and PBS where I, I got this image from has a really nice uh, graphic called Who's Who in Human Evolution that I would suggest uh, you taking a look at. It really does a nice job of outlining both uh, what type of hominid species were present as well as when they were present and some specific characteristics of those. I would definitely suggest taking a look at that. Uh, but, but what we can see from this very simply is that multiple different species were present at the same time on the Earth. Here's Homo sapiens existed probably at the same time um, as Neanderthals, um, as well as some of these other species here um, being present on the Earth at the same time. Uh, if we were to outline some of the fossil trends of these different species, 
Um, here's a couple of different species when they lived and kind of the different locations of where they lived. I would suggest uh, taking a second to maybe pause this and jot down some of these different trends here if you'd like or visit that uh, PBS Who's Who uh, animation simulation. Some of the other fossil trends uh, of humans and ancestors is the migration out of Africa and, and basically the fossil evidence suggests and supports that uh, hominid species migrated out of Africa and kind of spread from there to various continents and this graph here does a nice job of kind of demonstrating that. Um, another trend is the increased adaptation to bipedalism or walking on two feet rather than four. Um, although we have some similar characteristics with uh, chimpanzees and other species that walk on four limbs, uh, the fossil record suggests that we can actually see the progression from walking on four limbs to primarily two. Some other trends that we see is increased brain size, uh, the decrease uh, relative size of the face, jaw, and teeth, so having a, a little bit smaller of a jaw um, and, and teeth size. Um, and so all of these trends kind of help to give us an idea of what's happening uh, with human ancestors and the development of, of today's modern human species. Unfortunately, the fossil record is not complete, and we really don't have an answer for everything. Um, it gives us clues, but it doesn't paint a complete picture. Um, Fossils are really actually pretty rare, um, and not everything that dies goes on to become a fossil. Some uh, soft body parts are rarely fossilized, so the organic tissue usually is not fossilized, it's just bones. Uh, oftentimes scavengers are going to destroy the remains and, and basically eating the remains. And the conditions have to be just, just perfect and just correct in order for a fossil to form. So it's really, really difficult for a fossil to form. And then beyond that, and all these, these uh, small conditions for a fossil just to form, it's really pretty difficult to actually discover fossils. And so our overall kind of from this is that the human fossil record is not complete. We have ideas and we have kind of, uh, we have an idea of, of how uh, human ancestors have developed and evolved, but we don't have a complete picture. The more information and the more fossils we find, the more clear that picture becomes. Um, going on from that, uh, skulls and teeth really provide a wealth of information for analyzing modern and ancestral hominids because it gives us an idea of what those different species ate and consumed. Um, we also, as, as we find new discoveries, we can basically change or adapt our hypothesis. Um, and what's really become important uh, most recently is DNA evidence, being able to sequence the, the DNA samples of different species. Uh, Neanderthals were, were relatively recently sequenced. Um, and so we can deduce and figure out how closely related different species are um, based off of the DNA evidence and rather than just structural features. Um, the last, uh, one of the last main topics that we want to look at is the correlation between diet and brain size. And we did uh, a good amount of time looking at this and discussing this in class. Uh, different ape species and different hominid species and human species have various different sizes of both the skull and the jaw. Um, and humans obviously have a very large brain in comparison. Um, lo a lot of different data suggests that the cranial capacity of, um, of hominids has increased uh, as we get more closer to today uh, to present time. There's definitely some benefits and consequences of having a larger brain size. Um, benefits being that there's increased tool use and complexity, the ability to use fire, uh, behavioral flexibility, learning, um, cooperation, communication. Uh, some consequences of all of this is longer gestation period, uh, development after birth uh, actually takes a while for that brain to continue to develop. The brain's not done developing until almost 21, uh, 22, 23, even maybe uh, 24, 25. Um, energetically, it's very expensive. The brain uses lots and lots of energy and assistance from parents. All of this is connected to the idea that um, by increasing and changing diet from more plant-based to meat-based uh, allowed the brain to get larger. And because of this, we have a lot of genetic, uh, because of this genetic evolution, we have uh, cultural evolution as well. Um, because of genetic evolution, we have innate behaviors, physical traits, larger brains, allowed hominids to learn, develop tools, communication, hunt in parties, etc. A lot of information on human evolution, but it's a really, really interesting topic. There's really some cool TED Talks out there as well that discuss this topic as well. Um, and we'll take a look at these closer in class.